Um, good evening, everyone, and thanks for joining us uh, for this interesting discussion and presentation from David uh, looking at AFID control using IPM methods and IPM products. Um, just to let you know that the webinar is being recorded and hopefully will be it should be posted then on the Chagas website in the next week or so. And all our previous webinars are up there as well. And we will, um, uh, yeah, like I said, we'll, we'll post this one up there. So David, I'll hand over to you. David is a technical advisor with um, Coppert and is covering all of Ireland, I guess. Um, we had a little run through the, the program earlier and it looks really exciting. And I know, uh, I suppose it's kind of a nice day for David to be presenting this because you've got a new product which came to the market today. Um, so it's really nice. So what I'll do, I'll hand over to you. The time is, it's about 40 minutes for presentation and then we can have a Q&A at the end. We've got a poll there that maybe I'll start that one. Um, and if anyone wants to join in on that poll, we can kind of get an idea about who's in the audience, uh, what your ideas are of IPM or, or what your experience is. We've also got in the chat line there, I've got a link for anyone who's looking for IASIS points, they can sign into that and record their attendance. And then I can pass that on to IASIS for uh, recording points for attending. And yeah, we've a good few people have answer questions there. So um, we, we'll just give that another minute or two. Uh, David, I don't know if you can see that or can you see the results coming in? I can't see the results. No, I can see the question, but I can't see the results. So okay. I'll have to share that. Well, I'll give you a quick overview now. We've got which sectors are you working in? We've 33% are working in nursery stock, zero in herbs, 7% uh, in soft fruit, are 12% soft fruit, 6% protected ornamentals, and 47% are other. Um, have you used IPM? 17 people, or 100% have said yes, and nobody has said no. Uh, what are your biggest barriers to control of aphids and other pests using IPM? Uh, using IPM, cost is 24%. Technical know-how is 53%, so that's the highest score. Time is 6%, access to programs is 21%, and access to products is also 21%. So technical know-how seems to be a barrier. So I think that's a, a great chance for us to bring some more clarity and, and a little bit more knowledge to, to growers this evening. Hopefully we can address that issue tonight, as you say. Yeah. Absolutely. David, I'll hand it over to you and I'll let you share your screen. So thanks very much. No problem. So just let me know this is coming up. All see that? Yeah, I can see that. That's great. Yeah. Fantastic. So as you said, my name is David Davidson. Um, I work for Copper Biological Systems. I've been working with them for now, this is my ninth year, covering Ireland, uh, giving talks to and um, advice to um, any customers who want to use copper products. So all our advice is free um, for those who want to learn more about using biological control. So tonight I'm talking about um, if a control using IPM, integrated pest management in protected crops. That covers all crop types. So we'll give examples as we go along. Okay, hang on a second. The screen is not moving. Where we go now? Yeah, there's a delay. So the first, what we're going to do first of all, we're going to talk about this wonderful creature, the aphid, which we all, in our own ways, hate because of what it does. But it is a, a wonderful creature and how it actually works. So it's important to understand our our opponent if we want to tackle it. So here's the aphid in all its glory. You can all see that, yeah? No problem, Dono. Yeah, good. Um, so you can see the stylet where it, it probes the leaf, the antenna. Um, it's got a stephonclea at the back. And it's got the, the what you call the clauda at the tail at the back of it. So we'll learn a little bit more about these features as we go along. So this stylet uh, here is designed to extract as much sap as possible in order to get enough protein for this insect to survive. And the stylet can actually go right down through the epidermal layer and get into the phloem xylem to get the to get the sap from the plant. So its objective is to get as much protein as possible. There's a lot of sap to extract to get that protein. And as a result, it uses a lot of honeydew at the back end to get rid of the, the excess sugar. So 
So what we're looking at here is basically how fast uh, an aphid population can multiply. So you can see the birth of the aphid, this is a live birth. So basically a lot of the time in the, in the greenhouse, it's all clonal. So they're, they're clones being produced. And you see all the babies inside the mother here being produced. Um, and there's a very fast, this curve is showing how fast the population increases. So as temperature increases, the, the rate of reproduction increases. So the optimum temperature for a lot of aphids would be somewhere between 20 and 25. At 23 degrees C, for instance, um, it takes seven days from this nymph being born to become an adult. So a very fast time, very fast uh, turnaround time. You've got two different forms of aphids so we should understand tonight. So first of all, you've got your, your unwinged and you've got your winged, the elip, or they're called the winged. And obviously we don't want to have too many winged because if we get them winged, then they're going to fly throughout the crop and infect other areas. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about that. Um, what really makes them turn winged? Well, this is what I want to show. One of the major reasons why they become winged or elip is to do with the amount of aphids on the leaf, the leaf. So we can see this graph shows the percentage of winged aphids and the number of aphids along the bottom axis on a leaf. So when you've got one aphid on a leaf, you have zero winged aphids. So as this number increases, you can see here the number of winged aphids as a percentage of the population increases. So when you've got 40 aphids, you've got over 50% over of the population that are winged, more, more close to 60% because they want to leave the leaf and move to new territory because it's too crowded, in their opinion, to be living on that leaf. One of the problems with aphids is how they spread. They, they spread vast distances, in some cases, hundreds of kilometers, using the air, air flow in, in, in the higher air streams. So you can see here, you've got the leaf where the aphid initially is living. Then it gets up into the higher air streams and it can be carried miles and miles, kilometers and kilometers, um, to a final destination point where it drop, drops down, lands on a leaf, tests out that leaf by tasting it. If it doesn't like it, then it moves on to another leaf or another plant. If it decides it likes that plant, then it will go through the settlement phase and it'll accept that leaf and it'll produce a colony. When that colony becomes too crowded, then they produce winged versions, the elite version, and they will then do short flights um, onto to other leaves and in fact, other plants, so therefore you get a spread throughout a glass house, for instance, or a crop. Why we fear if it's so much, one of the reasons is that they can pass viruses, and this is quite a common thing in salad crops, for instance. Now, there are two types of virus transmission. The first one at the top here is called non-persistent. So this is when the stylets of the aphid, the feeding parts, uh, really just penetrate the, the epidermal layer, which is the cells on the upper part of the leaf. So they cause a temporary um, effect. But if the um, if it actually gets down into the phloem um, and, and inject these leases uh, its contents from slivery grounds, then you're going to get a permanent virus transmission into the plant. So you get persistent transmission. If it's are obviously don't want to get eaten by uh, natural predators, so they have got various ways to protect themselves. So one of these ways is through um, a thermal warning, and they use here the siphons to actually give off a thermal warning to warn all the other aphids that there's a problem. Um, in this case, then this might actually cause some of the other aphids to panic and actually just fall off the plant to get away from the prey. Um, the aphid can also defend itself by doing honeydew bombardment, where it actually produces a lot of honeydew and makes a sticky stickiness, which actually um, basically puts off the predator from trying to uh, attack it. Uh, there's a lot of honeydew in a colony, for instance, um, parasitic wasps will try to avoid the middle of that colony. They'll also kick with their back legs if they can to try and get the predator away, so they do try to defend themselves. Not always successfully, thankfully for us. You'd be pleased to know. So we're going to just have a look at some of the main aphids. Obviously there's a lot of aphids out there. And, and we don't expect to know them all, um, but we should be aware of the main aphids that, that can attack commercial crops. So the ones I come across very frequently um, is the first one on the top left, it's called Aphis gasipii, um, commonly known as the cotton aphid, but it does affect a wide range of host species. So therefore it is a, a bit of a problem. 
one of the more common ones I would come across would be cucumber crops, where you'd find it most years on a cucumber crop. Um, I also find that strawberries and in ornamental crops. We'll talk a little more about that aphid in a minute or two in the next slide. Uh, then below it, you have got Macrosiphum euphorbia, which is basically the potato aphid. It's a very easy one to distinguish because it's, it's, it's a large green aphid with a, this green, dark green stripe that runs down its back. So it's very easy to identify. Very commonly found in Ireland um, on a wide range of species, potatoes being one of them, um, strawberries being another one, for instance, and a whole lot of ornamental crops and salad crops. Then this one here um, on the right hand side um, is, is, got, is Olicoth and Salami. Um, the Dutch sometimes call it the foxglove fox aphid. Um, we would probably call it more likely the uh, greenhouse potato aphid. So it is a bit confusing one, you've got the potato aphid and the greenhouse potato aphid, but they're two completely separate species. Olicoth and Salami, the reason why this is quite an awkward species is that it will cause um, a reaction in the plant, a very nasty reaction in the plant, where the plant becomes distorted very quickly, with, with even quite a low population of this aphid. So it's, it's, it happens particularly in pepper crops, where you see the whole head of the plant become distorted. Below this, you'll find another aphid species, which is very common, the peach potato aphid, Mises persica, um, very common. It can be orange. Um, you can also find green versions of it. So it's just to show why sometimes it can be confusing to uh, identify aphid species. The, this is the same aphid species on the left hand side in a green and a black form. We've mentioned it before. It's the um, uh, aphid specifici, which is the commonly known as the cotton aphid. So it can be completely black or it can be green. But what gives it away is the little black uh, breathing particles at the back. You can see them here, they're still black. Um, here's the winged version of the same aphid. Again, um, you can have this variation, and the next example, it's the um, Macrocyphon euphorbiae. So this is the potato aphid. It can be green and aubergines, for instance. And a tomato crop, you may find it as a red aphid. So it does vary from host to host what color um, you'll find. Okay. Just getting a little bit of delay in the slide moving here at the minute. There we go. You may notice these little white um, objects on the leaf. And some people, if they don't look close enough, may just all think they've got white fly. But if you look, no, it's not white fly. It's basically the cast skins of the aphid. Because the aphids have to go through typically four molting stages uh, when they're nymphs before they become an adult. And every time they, they molt, they have to cast their skin, their exoskeleton off their body uh, in order to enlarge themselves. So you find these cast skins. as a telltale sign, actually, when you go scouting looking for aphids, like you'll see this, where they've been molting. And also on this leaf, you can see the, 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 the sooty mold. So this sooty mold grows on the leaves, platysporum grows on the leaf, basically uh, where, you, where you find the honeydew deposit and it grows on the sugar. This picture on the right just basically shows the wing buds at the final stage of the nymphal stage of, um, of the aphid before it becomes an adult. So here we can see some of this distortion I've been talking about in the pepper crop, for instance. Um, and this is caused by this um, the glass-sized potato aphid. You can see them actually in the flowers, which is a bit nasty. Um, and here in this instance, you can see uh, Mises persica. And look how many aphids are on the plant. The whole plant, the whole head is completely covered on the aphids. And it basically stunts the growth of the, of the crop. Through, through this slide, and just to say that sometimes we have nature on our, on our, on our side. And quite often I come across this when I'm walking through crops, particularly in the autumn time, you'll find aphid colonies collapsing. And the reason behind this is that they're being um, actually infected by, by naturally occurring fungi. So they call entopathogenic fungi. I wish we had this commercially, but we don't have this commercially at the moment. But it's a nice thing to have if it happens in your glass house and you can, can control some of the aphid population. You do need decent humidity for, for it to occur. And it can vary in color, anything between a, a white pale gray to an orange brown, depending on the species of mm. fungi and also depending on the species of aphid. So, some of you were saying tonight that one of the barriers to using biocontrol would be an IPM control to control aphids is 
on not having the technical know-how. Well, I just want to go through how the, you know, the, the logical steps involved in taking on IPM strategy for aphids. So the four things I want to mention tonight, and we'll be focusing a lot on the biocontrol, of course, um, is monitoring, um, cultural control, biological control, and chemical control. And I would suggest chemical control is the last option in an IPM program. So the first thing here is monitoring. So you could look at sticky traps, for instance, I'll we'll look at the slide of that in a minute. Um, but in the case of aphids, um, I believe that if the traps alone are not the answer, you also have to walk the crop and search through the crop, knowing where to look, particularly on the, on the young growing shoots, um, to find the aphids and have a hand lens could also be helpful to actually identify the species if, if you're having difficulty. So weekly crop walks, if not more often than that, would be necessary. Uh, traps do help a little bit, but as I say, I think you've got a crop walk. Um, cultural control. So we're thinking about, um, again, how clean is your plant stock? That's the first place you have to check. Find out the history of where your plants have come from. Know your propagator. Know their spray records. What have they sprayed? What problems have they had? Um, try to get them to be open with you. Um, check the plants your, yourself upon arrival. If you can keep them in a separate area until you put them in the main glass house, until you've checked them, that would be good. Think about your weed control. So many times I've found weeds in the corners of glass houses, under benches and corners, in the surrounds around the glass houses, near the doors. Um, are people forgetting to pull the weeds out around the glass houses, around the tunnels? Remember to do this because this will allow the aphids in. Um, think about the hedges and the trees nearby. How close are they? Um, are aphids likely to come in? What can you do about that? Can you exclude them in any way? Can you use netting across the crop? Um, some people have netting on ventilation, but that's not good from the point of view of, of the actual ventilation, so that's difficult. Um, then we want to look at biological control. We'll talk about that in more detail. We're going to talk about preventative versus curative. You might also think about can you um, create your own colony of native um, biological controls by having flower borders, for instance, and this is being this is happening in some large farms. Then we have the chemical control, which generally speaking, I would say should be a last resort, but sometimes it is used purposely um, prior to the introduction of biological control. If we think we're going to have a problem and we can clear out the problem to start with before we introduce the biological control. Um, for instance, uh, Batavia would be used as a spray maybe early on as strawberries before the, the flowers extend. Uh, this would have maybe a longer lasting effect before we introduce the biological control when we don't then have the option of using Batavia any longer. Um, so we want to have the chemicals to knock back the initial if a population, particularly maybe an overwintering strawberries, for instance, and then we can then introduce a biological control through the flowering period and the fruiting period. Always remember to use, uh, when you're going to go down this route, you have to use compatible pesticides. So. Um, there are different side effect apps out there, not just from copper, but copper have got a free side effects app, which you can download on your phone from the Google Play Store or from the Apple Play or from the Apple Stores. It's free. You don't have to use our product to use the app, and it's very user friendly. So I'm just going to show you the results I did earlier um, using four chemicals that are on the off label list on the PCS website um, for protected ornamentals. So you, just to give you an example of what you see in the side effects app. So the first one here is desis, um, and this is in the red zone. Red means danger. So you've got a color code of green, yellow, amber, red. Green being the safest, then yellow, then orange, then red being the most dangerous. So green means, green one means you will kill less than 25% of your predators, your, your, your biocontrol. Yellow two means you will kill between 25 and 50%. Uh, Orange three means you will kill between 50 and 75%, and red four means you will kill between 75 and 100% of your predators, even with one spray. So if you want to use biocontrol, you can see that thesis is not the one to use. And you can see here, it tells you the period for danger is eight to 12 weeks. So once you spray thesis, if the crop is not growing out of the chemical spray and getting new leaves, then all the existing needs that you sprayed are potentially harmful to biological control for a period of two to three months. You can see Flipper here is very safe, but you can see other products such as Steward, which will be used for like caterpillar control, for instance, is a mixed situation depending on the, on the, on the biological control. For some, it's green. For some, it's orange. Um, so it's fully green here for a lacewing larva. 
Um, others are slightly dangerous, um, for instance, for parts of the wasps, a little bit more dangerous for uh, printed image, um, and not dangerous at all for um, hoverflies. So it just depends what it is. The packet here you can see is reasonably dangerous. You know, two is acceptable, but it's not ideal. Um, so just to, so you, the side effect that tells you all of this, you just type in the product name or the chemical name, um, and then you type in the product name or the Latin name for the biological, and you can get these charts produced on your phone or on the website. I also want to mention that you shouldn't completely ignore fungicides. Most fungicides are usually not as dangerous as, as insecticides, but there are some that have effects. So you can see here this particular fungicide um, has a three for the one of these biological controls. Uh, sulfur um, it can also be a little bit dangerous in some some uh, IP biological, so you have to be careful with that as well. So if you're using sulfur, just check uh, which predators you're using, what biological control you're using, and is it compatible. So we mentioned monitoring. So one example of uh, monitoring is an insect trap. So this is the copper version of an insect trap called the harbor trap. In this case, it's yellow. There are also blue traps, but the yellow one is the one that's used for for aphids and for other insects like white fly and so on. Um, this can be used for monitoring and our recommendation be, would be one trap every 200 square meters for monitoring purposes and checked once a week on the same day every week and account taken. You can see our trap has a few features that do help. It's got these little square grids that mean it makes it easier to count. You don't lose count because you can remember which square you've been in. Um, another thing that's quite handy about the trap is the W that's cut out of it so it means you don't have to use the holes. You can actually use the W to open up the trap and fix the trap to, uh, to a string or a line for, for faster mounting. But I would never rely on traps completely for either monitoring or for control of aphids. Um, I think traps are much more useful for other pests such as whitefly, for instance, or thrips or, or scarred fly, but not for aphids. We mentioned some of the cultural things you can do. So here's a flower border. And, uh, it could be used to enhance your hoverfly population, for instance, or you could put a, a physical barrier over lettuce, for instance, here you can see, just to try and keep the aphids out as long as possible. So looking at the biological solutions, um, we're gonna cover some of these in detail tonight, but not all of them, just due to time. But all of these options are available through, through Copper or through other companies, for instance, um, and you could get them. So we're gonna focus mainly on three types of um, biocontrol tonight, we're going to be looking at the parasitic wasps here and here, um, and at the predatory midge species, if I these, and also at the predatory um, lacewing larva, uh, which um, we call Chrysopa. And we'll also be looking at the rearing uh, banker plant system to increase your parasitic wasps called Herbie Bank. So starting off with the parasitic wasps, uh, this is a single species that, that's available through more for various suppliers um, and the, the product's called Aphidius colmani. Um, in our case this is called Aphipar. Just some facts about it. So you can see here that this is the female parasitic wasp. You can see the size of it in relation to the aphid and the, what happens is the, the, the wasp lands on a leaf and it then goes over to the aphid and uses its antennae to drum on the, on, like this here, on the on the, on the aphid. And by doing that, I can actually work out, first of all, what aphid species it is and whether it's suitable for it to lay its egg into. And secondly, has the, an egg already been deposited by another parasitic wasp previously? If it has, if either of these things don't match up, in other words, it's got an egg inside it or it's the wrong species, then it ignores the aphid. If it, has, it is the right species and it hasn't got an egg laid into it, then it will proceed to uh, size up the aphid and put its abdomen below itself and inject an egg into the aphid. So most of the eggs in this particular species are laid within the first three days of hatching, although the wasp can survive around about 10 days um, between at, at that sort of 18 to 20 degrees temperature. And typically a female will produce about 300 eggs. Other parasitic wasps can produce more eggs in this. I'm going to talk about one later on, just 500 eggs. But, on average per female. So there's quite a lot of eggs per female being laid and all of those should, most of those should mature into new parasitic wasps and then produce a new um, population to then reinfest more aphids. So here's just some more pictures of this particular wasp species. Um, you see here it's laying its eggs into the, 
aphids cassipi with the black at the back. If you see this, this the, the, the cotton aphid. You see how we how we distribute it. Copper have a, a boxes called D boxes that you can fold out and hook up on a plant and then pour the product into the little D boxes to let them hatch out. Preferably put them away from the sun so they get a little bit shade away from direct sunlight. You see here in this picture on the bottom left, um, here is the wasp actually hatching out. So it cuts a little door, a little hatch door out the back after it's pupated and, and, then, and then basically pushes itself out of the aphid to produce a new, become a new wasp species which then mates and then lays more eggs within the first three days of hatching. Um, here you can see the mummy here that with the hole at the back where it's already hatched out of this little white hole, so you know that it's already completed its life cycle, has left this particular aphid, this dead aphid. So these are called mummified aphids. They, they look like mummies basically when they've been parasitized. So we can actually see here the whole process could take somewhere between 10 and 50 days, depending on the temperature. So at 10 degrees C, uh, sorry, 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 30 degrees C, it takes 10 days. Um, and the, 50 days at 10 degrees C. So it depends on temperature how fast the whole process takes from laying the egg until the larva grows inside and then hatches out as a new adult wasp. So again, this is just illustrates what I've been saying. You see here this graph, this first graph here shows that um, 20 degrees C and 25 degrees C, how many eggs are laid over a number of days. So you can see here that most of the eggs are laid in this species over the first three to four days, but that it can survive anywhere between eight and 12 days. Um, that most of the eggs are laid here, but uh, sorry, sorry, start again. Most of the eggs are laid here. You see the survival thing over here basically shows you that it can survive anywhere between nine and 14 days, depending on the temperature for this particular wasp species. So this is the survival one, sorry, but if you, this is the survival graph here. Uh, other wasp species we'll find can survive slightly different times, and it's depending on the wasp species. Some of them are, are quite long lived. Heard of this one? Moving on, this is another wasp species which is about twice the size of the one we talked about previously. Why did I mention this particular one? Um, because I just wanted to explain that larger wasp species, in this case, is Ophidia cervi, um, prefers to lay its eggs into larger aphids. So it prefers to lay its eggs into um, here the potato aphid, the macrocyphon. Forbii, um, for instance, whereas the one we looked at before wouldn't like to lay its eggs into this particular species. Uh, it also likes to lay its eggs into the grasshouse potato aphid and the, the peach potato aphid, an aggressive parasite. Um, and also an interesting feature about this one, um, as with other parasitic wasps, they can actually um, cause a bit of a sort of disturbance in the aphid colony. It can lead to mortality of the aphids because some of them decide to fall off the leaf, they escape. The parasitic wasp and they can't then find a way back up onto the plant. So you have the disturbance factor as well as the pure parasitism which helps control the aphids. Just to show you that um, each, 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 each parasitic wasp um, has its own particular likes and dislikes uh, as we talked about. So you can see here uh, aphids culmini, the, the aphid power we talked about, has a strong liking for the, um, the cotton aphid, this black aphid, and also Mises birchia, uh, the peach potato aphid. But if you go to the Irving, it has more of a liking then for the potato aphid and the glasshouse potato aphid. So one of the thing, one of the barriers for growers is, I suppose, knowing uh, which aphid species you've got and which parasitic wasp to use. Well, um, we're very aware of that. So what we what we do, what we find is, is that there's a product that we're going to talk about now called Aphid Scout. And why this is good, it takes a lot of this uh, thought process away. You don't have to worry so much about identifying the particular aphid species you have because this product has a, a mix of aphid species, or I'm sorry, a mix of parasitic wasps that will affect a range of aphid species. So this picture here is just showing the eyes, uh, looking through the eyes of the wasp at the aphid. And what we're saying is we want um, these little wasps will find the aphids before you find them. So we'll let them do the scouting for you. And that is, that is true, I always find this. If I find an aphid colony, quite often I find some parasitized aphids in the aphid colony before I find the colony. And quite often that's occurring. So aphid scout, um, as you mentioned, does the scouting for you. It's a mix of five different parasitic wasps, and we're going to see a picture of those in a, in a later slide. And it means you can do a range of the, the most commonly occurring commercial 
horticultural, agricultural aphids. It doesn't do every single species, but it does do a good range of them. This is the way it comes in a tube, like a cardboard tube like this. So one thing I would say, if you're overhead watering, that's the one thing you need to think about where you put, where you locate your tubes. I've seen some people build little um, covers on their on their um, stanchion supports in their greenhouse to set the tube in under to stop the water directly hitting the tube. Apart from that, it's a very versatile tube, um, and you'll find 250 watts inside this tube. It comes with a, a double layer um, sticky cover so you can peel that back from the corner and then you can stick the tube to a wire or onto a stanchion post or onto um, the side of a glass house wall. It's very sticky, it will stick no problem and you put it horizontally and then you turn it until you have the five little hole openings for the wasp to come out. Be careful there are some factory settings on there, don't set it to the larger holes because I have found earwigs and spiders like to crawl in and we really don't want them to set up residence in there before the parasitic wasps have hatched out. So inside that little tube, when the parasitic wasps hatch out, there is a nectar pad where they can collect some sugar water to get a bit of energy before they leave the tube, and then they leave the tube. Just to show you what happens when you use parasitic wasps, so um, the, the, the blue line shows the, the increase in the aphid population without any parasitic wasps in the crop. And when you're using parasitic wasps, you find that you can get a 20% reduction in the growth rate. Uh, which, you, which means you get a six-fold difference in the number of aphids after 10 days. So there is a big, big difference whenever you have the, the right number of parasitic wasps in a crop compared with the growth factor, compared to not having them. So here are the five different species, um, and they're all slightly different in appearance. Um, so this one here is um, Philanus, which is very different to the rest of them. But here's the breakdown. So there's 40% crown bulker. But we're going to talk about it because it's a very, very important species. It's naturally occurring. It's very good at uh, parasitizing a wide range of um, aphids, and it's very recognizable. It's uh, it's it's mummified the version, which you'll see in a minute. And then you have 20% Colmanae, 15% Irvi, and uh, then you've got the Aethylinus aldemalis, this one here, 15%, and 10% Aphidurus. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about these in a second. So here are the different mummies, and you can see you can recognize the parasitic wasp species by the, by the appearance of the mummy. The ones that are not so easy to identify the difference in would be the Colmanae and Irvi, which are both sort of brown to gold globed um, mummies, but the rest are quite distinct. This prey and bulker has a little platform below it and a papery consistency, so it's very easy to identify the mummy. And I love to find these because I know that we're really getting control of the when I find a lot of prey and bulker uh, mummies in the crop. Um, the fitters is an interesting one because it actually um, causes the aphid to try and hide. So whenever it infects the aphid, the aphid goes away and tries to hide away. So they're quite often hidden, the mummies. Um, I think it must be a defense mechanism uh, that it wants the, the aphid to go and hide away before it hatches out. Um, quite a, a comical one was when I actually saw them, that all the aphids crawled off the crop down onto the leg below the below a, a tabletop strawberry, and they're all located on, on the leg below. Um, so I would say they've all been on the march once they got infected by, by, by this particular parasitic wasp. So how do you use them? Uh, think about the rates of applications. So generally speaking, we have uh, preventative and curative. Preventative would be uh, one tube per 400 square meters every 14 days for the period of time that you feel you have to protect the crop. Typically, that's usually uh, three or four applications, maybe over a two month period, for instance. Um, if you want to go curative, you go weekly and you go one tube every 200 square meters every seven days. And we find if you do that for three weeks in a row, you can usually get control in a light curative situation. Sometimes you have to go to four applications. Placement, just to show you how easy it is, you can see here the tabletop strawberries in the tunnel and the, the tube is attached here to, to, the, to the line that runs below the tabletop. So here's some pictures of what it looks like. So if it's working, you can find that you get a really high percentage uh, parasitization going on, where you get um, more than 90% parasitization. Um, and you can really get very good control. We know in strawberries now, we've got a lot of experience in strawberry crops, and a lot of large farms are using them. In the UK and now in Ireland, the last couple of years, I've got some farms at them, and we're finding we're getting good control as long as you use them at the right time. 
David. Yeah. Sorry, I've a question came in there. Is it okay to take questions while you're yeah. presenting, or would you like no to wait? No problem. Until the yeah, end? no, don't mind it going on slightly more. That's fine. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, well, just on the the AP Scout, um, mm -hmm. the best temperatures to use them at. You said they're sixteen to thirty, I think, in a previous slide, right. and you had or um, unheated strawberry tunnels. Yes, so you do need to be able to curve about the timing of that. So we never really introduced them into the tunnels until the end of March, and that would normally be sort of in, in the southern English areas. So in Ireland, a more cautious approach would be required than that. Um, so you really want to have, when we say 16 degrees, we need to have that during the daytime. If it does drop below that at night, um, as long as it's not very cold, it's not really an, not usually an issue, but we need to get the temperature heated up for a number of hours during the day to get the activity levels going again in the parts of the gloss. So the weather we have this week, if I had a, a AP Scout to hand, would it be better to wait or would oh, it be yeah. useful this week? Yeah, you might delay putting it out by a day or two if you know the temperatures are going to change, but you don't want to keep the, the door closed too long because we know they lay their eggs typically within the first three to five days. So the longer you hold them in the tube, the more frustrated the wasp is going to become wanting to lay its eggs. Okay. So it's better to put them out if you know at all that you're going to get a rise in temperature in the next few days. Um, so there's not much you can do to get a, a prolonged period of cold. Then basically the parts of the wasp will become quite inactive. Um, there is one particular one that will be more active, this Irving species, um, even, even at 12 degrees, it's more active than some of the other ones. Some of the other ones need 15, 16 degrees to be active. So that's why we say 16 degrees to cover to cover that information, really, to make sure people aren't trying to use them when it's too cold. And we have been instances okay. in tunnels where you have heated beds below the strawberries. And in that case, you can release them earlier into the tunnels. So I don't know if that answers the question. That's great. Thanks. Thanks, David. Yeah. So, um, most of the species in the tube, apart from, uh, I think there's one, the fitters, are all going to be sort of, um, you know, it's, they're, they're naturalized or native. They do, they are quite versatile outside, just a little bit more, in a, less, in a, less active. So just to show here, here's a chart, um, which shows you in particular, I just picked strawberries there. We have charts for ornamentals and herbs and all sorts of things for this product, but just to show as an example here, strawberry. So typical, if it's on a strawberry crop, um, you might get, and which wasp is the best one to do the job on that particular aphid. So you can see here, most of the wasp species are covered. This chart's slightly inaccurate, but now we know that uh, Van Volker actually does a reasonable job on the strawberry aphid from experience. So I would actually make this 2x as well than 1 um, for that. Apart from that, um, you can see here the strong points then for the Volker and Volker is the potato aphid and the rose aphid, um, whereas the strong point for the Comana in the mix is going to be the cotton melon aphid um, and the peach potato aphid. Um, Herve is going to be a strong point of the, uh, you can see here, the, the three X's are and so on. All right, so these charts are available to help you so you understand um, if you use the product. Moving on, um, one thing that might be a problem is if you release your wasps and there's no aphids in the crop, if they can't find aphids to lay within their life cycle, they die. So one way around that is to use what we call a banker plant system. In our case, it's called Irby Bank. It's a wheat that comes pre-inoculated with, inoculated with around about 500 um, aphids that only affect monocotyledonous plants. So they will not affect broadleaf plants and their wingless. So you can put them into your broadleaf crop. Typically what we do, we hang them up in hanging baskets and you put a dripper into them to feed them. And then you release the parasitic wasps in the vicinity of the banker plants and they lay their eggs into the aphids. And then you get 500 times or more what you start out with, because obviously if there's more, they start out with 500 aphids, but as the banker plant matures, that increases to more than 500 aphids. And each of those have the potential to be parasitized by your parasitic wasps. So then you get the second generation of a lot more parasitic wasps than what you started out with. And you have a, a standing army there waiting to attack the aphids when they arrive in the crop. Now, typically they could be replaced, you could be putting in new ones of those on a cycle. So if you want to have continuous, you might have every two weeks, you might have a few replacements going in, just to have a continuous cycle of banker plants in the crop. Because they will go off after a while, they will get mildew and so on, and you need to replace them. And they will run out of aphids as well, of course. Um, 
Some of the things that maybe make this whole system fall apart is hyperparasitism. So hyperparasitites will, over time, hone in on monocrop situations and lay their eggs inside our parasitic wasps and then prevent them from hatching. And so they then disrupt the whole biological control cycle. You can see here what you're looking out for is this type of hole here. It's a ragged edge hole anywhere on the body, as opposed to the perfectly round hole in the case of the aphidia species at the back end. So if you get this, you know you're in for trouble and you might need to think about switching off the parasitic wasps and moving on to other alternatives, which we're gonna talk about. So we've got two alternatives we're gonna talk about tonight. The first one is the gall midge, aphidolides aphidomyza. So this is a naturally occurring gall midge. I find it quite often, I actually found it last week naturally occurring in a cucumber crop in Ireland. Um, so it's nice to find it when you find it naturally occurring. Um, and here's the life cycle. So You've got the adults, um, and quite often likes to hang upside down during the day on spider web, spider web, or sorry, spider webs. Um, it also mates on the webs. It likes to hide away. It's not. It basically flies at dawn. Um, it actually flies at dusk, during the night and dawn, and then sleeps uh, during the daytime. And here are the little eggs. You can find the little eggs if you if you've got good eyesight. Certainly with a hand, then you'll find them. And they're little orange eggs. Mm -hmm. And they lay their eggs, they're very good at finding aphid colonies, and they'll, they actually lay more eggs depending on the number of aphids on the leaf. They actually work out how many aphids are on the leaf and how many eggs to lay. Um, they prefer to lay eggs actually when there's larger aphid colonies. They will hatch into these, these larvae, which then feed on, on the aphids. And typically, um, you will find that a larva will eat somewhere between 10 and 100 aphids per larva. And if there's more aphids than the larva can actually eat, it will still continue to kill aphids, so it will kill more than it eats. It will, it will actually, um, par basically it grabs a hold of the aphid and it can actually scent them out from several centimeters away and it will actually paralyze them before um, just sucking out their contents. They then drop down to the ground to pupate um, and then hatch out into new, par into new adult midge, gold midge. So here's the female and here's the male. The male's got the long antenna. And here's them hanging upside down, how they mate on, on the webs. And here's the male part for mating. Um, so this is a diagram. So what we're showing here is, this is a very easy to use product because I would recommend it. you use uh, IFRN 1000 and put out the, the bottle. Basically, all you have to do is open the lid and set the bottle somewhere shaded, up, just upright, the way it is in the picture. And then what happens is, if you just watch the diagram, the, um, it, the the midge hatches out and crawls up through the, through the um, carrier material and then flies out and finds somewhere to fly. But it tends to like to fly out starting an hour or two before dusk and then depending on several hours before dusk, they'll leave the bottle. Mm. Actually, this, this, I want to show you this graph because it illustrates even at 13 centimeters depth of carrier material, the midge can still crawl to the top out of the carrier material and leave the bottle. There's no problem in getting from the bottom to the top in that, in that bottle of the carrier material. Um, this other graph here on the right hand side illustrates how far they can fly. So you can see quite easily, this is the meters away from the bottle, and this is the percentage of plants with larva found. So you can see even at 18 meters, there's almost 90% of plants had larva on them. Um, even at 45 meters away from the bottle, you can get around about 25% of plants with larva found on them. So they do disperse widely from the bottles. Moving on, just because of time, um, uh, we're just going to look now at the final thing. So we're looking at Chrysopa. Um, Chrysopa basically is a lacewing larva. Um, so it's Chrysoperla carnea. And Chrysoperla carnea is, a, is basically a predator. It's a, it's, the, it's a larva of the lacewing that eats all aphid species virtually. Um, in our case, it comes in two pack sizes, 1,000 and 10,000. Um, and they feed on the festive eggs, and they're inside be uh, wheat huts. They're hiding from each other because they are cannibalistic. They try to hide away from each other when they're in the bottle. And they prefer aphids, but they will also eat other things such as um, meaty bugs, for instance, thrips, spider mites, white flies, so on. Um, they prefer to have low growing costs because they like to crawl around the canopy. They find it hard to crawl up and down tall plants. So low growing crops are better for them. So you can hear, see here the larva in action. It just comes up from behind the aphid and lifts it up, grabs it, 
and just chews it and sucks out the contents of the body. It digests, it's put digestive enzymes in there and then just sucks out the body contents. Quite a horrific diff. So you can see here basically, and, and also what I should say, they're quite nocturnal. So a lot of this happens at nighttime. Here's the egg of the, um, on, on, on the hair you can see, it's off the leaf, off the um, lace wing. Here's the nymph, even at a young stage, feeding on the, the poor aphid. Here's when it goes into the pupil stage, and then here's the lovely adult. The adults are quite beautiful, actually. And, and I'm always pleased when I find them in, in a glass house. Finally, um, we also have this lace wing larva in a product, which is now an egg form, and it was just launched today, out of it, just by, by just by coincidence, we've launched it today. Um, so this new product's available. So rather than just buying lace wing larva, you can also buy the eggs. Why the eggs, you might ask yourself your question. Well, one of the reasons is we would like to make uh, aphid control as affordable as possible. So um, if we can supply eggs at a, at a lower cost, it means people can use uh, predators over larger areas um, and have more success. So more predators per square meter, greater assurance of success. The, the, the drawback, I suppose, would be you have to let the eggs hatch out. So there is a, a time lag um, of a week or two while you're waiting for the eggs to hatch out. When they do hatch out, they're smaller larvae. So they eat less aphids for the first little while. But once they get going, then they will do the same job. The thing is, you have to be more organized, use them more preventatively um, to put them in the crops. But the fact that you've got 100,000 in one tube like this means that um, there, there are maybe a more cost-effective way to use lace wing larva. What we're saying to people, um, and the, one of the things that we should say is also that they're, they're a pure product. So if you have any contamination issues, like just for instance, for, uh, we, we, are, we do engage with um, med medicinal cannabis crops in, in places like Canada, which are very interested in this product because there's no carry material, there's no contaminant getting on the medicinal, on the medicinal plants. Also herbs, for instance, you may not want the contaminant. So these pure egg products should be very ha helpful for that. But we are hopefully in the future going to have a, a carrier material as well, which may be useful for crops like strawberries, where we just want to see where we're sprinkling the eggs. So it depends on the situation. At the minute, there's no carrier. In the future, there could be carrier as well as carrot. So there could be two forms of the product. Just want to quickly show you, um, this orange line shows without using the uh, lace wing. This red line shows when you use lace wing larvae in the strawberries. And this is the number of strawberry aphids up here. And this is the number of days from release along the bottom. So when there's none, you can see the aphid population. When you use the larva, you can see here that the decrease in the population um, happens a little bit faster to start with. There's a lag period then if you use the eggs. Um, the, the, this turquoise is with feed. This blue line is without feed. We find that we don't need feed. We just need to have the eggs, um, whether they're put on the same leaf or more distributed you get a similar result. And at the end of the day, you get a very good result using lace wing eggs on the population of strawberry aphids in this case. What we're finding is you get about 74% on average um, hatching rate. So if you put 100,000 eggs out, you get around about 74,000 larvae. That's on average. Um, we reckon in this case for the strawberries, we reckon you needed to have 10 eggs to replace the effect of one larva um, to get the same control. In some cases, you might only need to have five, depending on the situation. So somewhere between five and 10 eggs to replace one larva if you're gonna use the Chrysopa E as opposed to Chrysopa. Um, okay. So the thing about it is you need to know that you need to evenly spread them out because they are cannibalistic. So you don't want to put them in the D boxes where they all eat each other. You wanna spread them out evenly across the leaf. Um, if you wanna do curative, you'll have to put them out a bit more concentrated. You wanna go a preventative and more widespread. Um, if you want to have very quick action, you better use the larva rather than the eggs because of the delay in them hatching out. Um, best applied by hand at the minute, but we also investigating using distributors like the copper mini airbug system. We have an airbug distribution system where it blows the eggs over the crop, for instance. Um, we mentioned here about the fact already using five to ten for one larva. Temperature range we mentioned already. It is a quite a is one thing you should know about these. They are quite uh, tolerant of cooler conditions, so 10 plus they will be active. And also they're quite resistant to pesticides, so they're more resistant to pesticides than other biological controls. Although obviously if you use desis or something like that, like that you are asking for trouble. But in generally speaking, they're, they're more resistant to chemicals. So that's a very quick overview of my talk. 
Um, I think it's a very quick through. I mean, obviously there's a lot more detail that could be talked about, but it was enough, hopefully, to give you enough information to get you thinking about file control and IPM, I hope. Um, just to mention then, um, that's my contact details and I, I do work with uh, Unicam in Ireland, so that, that's who you would talk to if you're interested in the products. Thank you. David, that's great, really, really interesting um, presentation. And I suppose at the start of the season, it's giving a lot of food for thought about how to approach different aphid pests. And, you know, a little um, positivity as well, that there, there's good options for controls. Earlier, we had spoken about, you know, that, that final part and a couple of the chemicals. Um, and I know you highlighted some of them there. There was... Um, and it's interesting to note that the lace wings are maybe a little bit more compatible with some of the, the products that growers might have been uh, familiar with previously or, or that have been used. Just, I suppose, looking at the context and why aphid control this year might be more tricky than it has been in the past. Some of the, the products that growers would have been used to aren't on the market anymore. anymore. So Exemptor which was incorporated with a growing media for vine weevil control also had an impact on aphids. AFOX, which was a kind of the go-to um, plant protection product for aphid control is no longer permitted for use on pretty much a whole range of crops in Ireland. Uh, beans and peas are the only uh, plants where it's permitted. So again, that's out of the question. So I think it, it's um, very much moving towards an environment where IPM, biological control, and maybe some of the physical acting products like Flipper, um, Majestic, Eradicote will be will be coming into play. And uh, do you have any anything you'd like to add to that in terms of some of the pro those products that might um, might be used by growers? Yes, I think um, one that's sorely missed is Clipso. <laughs> that, that's one that has been irreplaceable nearly in the soft food sector, for instance. Um, other ones that growers do use, and I don't mind working with growers if they use things like Gazelle, though we do need just to think a little bit about the period of time for reintroduction, one to two weeks, depending on the on the product that we want to reintroduce. So we could work with Gazelle. Um, Sequoia is another one we talked about a little bit before. It's one we could use. Um, it's actually very good if you want to use it with, par, with um, predatory mites for thrip control or spider mite control. It's very compatible, actually, or even for white fly control. But unfortunately, it has got a few side effects against parasitic wasps, maybe up to two weeks. Um, and also for the predatory midge, the uh, Phytolides, Phytomyza, the aphid end, it's a probably one week danger period for that one. But again, not out of the question, you can reintroduce. So you could work with Sequoia and reintroduce. And you're not going to kill 100%. So you're going to get a bit of a knockback, but not, not 100%. So we could work with Sequoia. Um, but we are getting more and more limited, and that, that means we're accelerating the whole process of having to learn to use these biologicals and other cultural methods before we're forced into the corner of not having the experience. So now's the time to experiment. Now's the time to find how far can you go with these things? Where are the limitations? Because there will be limitations, but to learn what they are now, while you still have a few yeah. get-out clauses in some chemicals that you can work with. And that would be my nice thought on that. At the, um, I suppose it, they, there's quite a, a bit of experience on the, the strawberry side for using biologicals and IPM. Uh, plant invigorator is widely used. Is there a fair amount of compatibility with the biological um, control agents and uh, SB plant invigorator? Well, SB plant invigorator obviously kills what it hits, but I mean, most, most um, predators are quite fast moving and, and, and biological controls, and they tend not to kill a large percentage of them so it's it's pretty safe it's the safe it's the safe as you're going to get it you know the green one less than 25 percent kill so i'm quite happy to use the sp invigorator um some growers would use that on a regular basis in soft fruit to try and just safeguard the crop where they can mm -hmm. because they don't want to disrupt anything else using uh, well they have very few options left now really apart from the tabby before flowering and maybe sequoia um but again even the bees, you need to bring the bees in when you use sequoia for a day or two, you know, for, for there's a few days. So there's a lot of things to think about, pollination and so on. Um, yeah. You don't think about that in ornamental crops, thankfully, so much. Yeah. Okay. Well, it, it, it's definitely playing in, um, I suppose, difficult to fit chemicals in, which is, you know, we, we would like to see the first option being softer, gentler options, of course. 
Yeah, which contact only, unfortunately. But then the applicators that you could use, maybe could help you to talk about a little bit about that, whether foggers would help, you know, whether systems to try and apply the product. Uh, well, I think we were coming up to nearly half past eight. Yeah. I, I would love to. Um, and maybe we, we, what we'll do, we'll answer some questions first and maybe come back to that. And if people would like to stay on and listen, um, would that be okay? Well, we'll just get, we'll give people the option of, of um, uh, signing out there at half past, as, as we uh, cool. said, we'd, we'd stick with that. So the first question that's come in there is, um, how well does the AFI Scout work on indoor large scale office planted areas? And is there any possible issue for use in office office spaces or for office users? I think the first thing that the only thing that might be a barrier would be the light levels, but that shouldn't be a major barrier really. Um, so if you have if it's in the crop and the temperatures are right and there's enough light for them to, to see, um, then hopefully then they, they could um, they could uh, do their thing. I suppose it depends if they're getting disrupted light at night time. You know, it might disrupt their patterns a little bit. Um, not so much natural daylight, so things like that might be a factor. But I think in principle, you could have a go with them. I don't see why they shouldn't work. Um, okay. Certainly with the AFI skirt, I think a lot of people don't mind, but they won't really notice the little wasps. They're so inconspicuous, you know, flying around. They won't bother people as such. So that's the only thing okay. to consider. Sometimes people might notice the odd insect flying about if, if people are sensitive. These are they're quite small, so it's a it's a safer option. Okay, very good. That sounds, that sounds very positive. Um, the question there, is there research done on other factors leading to increases in pests like aphids? So what is, how would I answer that question? What would you, what would you take that? Um, what was the question? Uh, are, well, I suppose are aphids uh, an increasing problem for in crop production? Or is it that the environment has changed, or is there there's some other factor that's mm. uh, triggering a rise if there is such a thing? Well, temperature is your uh, temperature is going to have a factor to play, and, and mild winters, um, monocrop situations. The more monocrop you have, the more you're going to um, bring in the the pest, um, and the lack of chemicals, which had which we didn't realize had an effect, but for stopping the use will also have this knock on effect. So I think all of those things are coming into play. Can you, um, migration of plants, um, importation of plants, bringing in uh, other species is a rising problem across the board. So yeah. things like that. I guess in protected crops, you've kind of got a protected environment, which supports a, a wider range of aphids that wouldn't naturally occur. So uh, that's true. Uh, and you get more life cycles, particularly if you're starting to use these uh, lit crops, then you're going to extend the range of time the crops are in the glass house. You get the green bridge, so you can't clean out. You can't clean out, then you're really asking for trouble. <laughs> okay. uh, we, what I would say to you, uh, for, in strawberries in particular, we're finding in the last two years a lot of overwintered aphids in the crowns of overwinter plants emerging as the, as the plants grow. And that's okay. something I spotted in the last two years of my job. Okay. Um, I didn't notice so much before. Mm. Okay, uh, and that's great. Another one there. Um, what types of cultural controls are recommended to use alongside the biological controls? Cultural controls. Um, well, I think we mentioned some of this stuff already. You're quite limited, really. But I mean, hygiene is everything, and 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 being aware of what your young plant material has on it when it arrives. Can you think of anything else? I'm trying to think what comes to mind that helps culturally. Apart from sort of hygiene and observation, you're kind of limited in uh, in cultural because uh, what suits the plant suits the aphids, you know. So you really want to optimize plant growth as well. Could I uh, mention one thing actually? Um, the level of nitrate in a plant will have an effect on aphid growth. So anything you can do to have more have less nitrate and more sulfate could slow down the growth rate of the aphids. Um, so that's something to have a look at. Just look into that topic area, um, okay. maybe for the future. We could manipulate the, the amount of nitrates on the plant. Okay, very good. Um, point here, uh, mummies can be considered a contaminant in some edible crops like salads and baby leaf. And are there any tips to rid mummies on edibles or even some flower crops? Unfortunately, I don't know any way to take away the mummies. Uh, that, you, you need to start looking at basically the predators in that case, I think, if that, that's going to be a contaminant. So you're going to have to focus more on the for the end species and on the on the lace wing larva and also things even such as we didn't talk about but maybe hoverfly larva for instance which are also commercially available 
So you can look at those predators rather than the parasites. Okay, very good. Um, some more, another two more questions. What do you think uh, the answer will be for aphid control in bedding plants where the biological controls don't have time to establish? Mm. Good question. Or, or what is the answer to that? Uh, it's got to be cultural. I don't know any other way around it. Um, you're stuck with the insecticides, I'm afraid. If that's, if that's going to be the, the story. I think chopping, unfortunately, doesn't get you out of it with aphids. It's not reliable enough to be used on its own to control mm -hmm. the aphid population. So we're, you're a bit stuck, really. But I think the fact that you have the crops coming in now so quick usually does mean that you don't get a, enough aphids establishing on some crops. To yeah, the, the crop problem. turn is, is helpful as well in, in preventing the population increasing too quickly um, or getting out of control. And, it, yeah. you know, is there their benefit maybe or would you have seen benefits in the use of um, lure crops or maybe mm -hmm. banker crops where you can have some sure. of the, the predators already established? Yeah, you could use aubergines, for instance, um, as well as the banker plant system we have, just to have uh, pre-existing high populations of parasitic wasps mm -hmm. and you could introduce cured rates of things like lacewing larvae maybe 50 per square meter um twice at one week intervals to go like a high cured rate fast into a crop and they will clear out uh, large aphid populations quite quickly if you get them in enough numbers fast enough same thing with aphid m it's also a very fast clearing process if you go like 10 per square meter at a high rate you could you could clear the population quite quickly okay that's it. Well, that would be really useful as well. Okay. Um, well, David, I'll say thank you very much for now. I know we said we, we'd uh, just touch on a, a little bit of uh, some of the other items um, and we won't keep you long because it is a, it's a evening time. Um, but just on behalf of everybody who has joined in, we've, we had the 31 people signing in and we, we've got 28 still with us. So I think that's there a really great sign that uh, people are really interested and enjoyed the the presentation and you know I, I found it really fascinating you know and even though I've kind of had a look at it earlier it's still it's um it's great insight into the, the options that are available mm. and uh you know it gives some good options we're, we're only looking at the first week of April you know temperatures are, are really only just starting to warm up and uh become suitable for some of the the biological options that are there so you know mm. it, it does give some um good options and uh Think people can look forward to some some benefits there so i'll say thank you at that point and um i know you've given out your contact details i have them there as well if anybody wants to get in contact or um they can contact you through uh copper or unicam i guess that's correct yeah one thing just to mention is the videos um so basically oh, yeah. you can look up the youtube channel copper youtube channel and there's a there's a whole host of videos on everything i've mentioned and many more things um so you'd be entertained for hours uh, with, with the videos you'd watch of, the, of, of little pests getting devoured in front of your eyes. <laughs> Very good. Uh, that's it. Well, that'll uh, make you happy, I suppose, to see see the crops being protected and pests becoming prey. Uh, so I'll say thanks very much for that. We might, if you like, we can jump into that discussion on um, fogging and maybe a, a physical aspects of control. But I, I'm conscious it's later in the evening i don't want to keep you so maybe if you have you know five minutes um at most if that suits and uh, we can chat about that okay. yeah and i know i know you're being put on the spot a little bit because it's not something that we have, no. we have discussed yet. yeah well it's it's difficult i mean you really got to get that penetration so you've got to think about your nozzle selection very carefully um i think if you can get the penetration um, you could have a knockback effect just get the buy yourself enough time to give that extra week for the biocontrol to pick up and that's what i encourage people to think about you know to think about if you have to use a bit of sb invigorator or flipper um to to use that and use that on a weekly basis through the period of time just to get the knockback effect just to give the predators and the parasites time to build up numbers to overcome the crop um whether you can use foggers or so on to help you it depends what equipment you have available to you um, but I think uh, also selection is definitely something to think about and, and try and dig it under the canopy of the plant and the, what way they what way the nozzles are pointed. And a lot of the growers in, in for instance in salad crops are well set up um, where they have the nozzles pointing you know in all directions to get 
the crop covered as much as possible and they're automated up and down the pathways. I'm sure I'm not quite sure exactly with the, with the ornamental sector how that how that varies depending on the nursery. But you know, having the right spray these days is going to be even more important because we need to think more about contact sprays. So really we need to look into this. So we've got the equipment available to allow you to get the knockback, to allow you to use the IPN system. Mm -hmm. so, I guess in the protected environment, you've got the option of having much higher uh, pressures in your sprayers where drift isn't going to be an issue and that's going to give you a smaller particle size and mm -hmm. should give you a better chance of hitting the, the pests with more finer particles. Yeah. Uh, so the cold fogging, is that something that you've seen in, in different aspects of horticulture or where it's most uh, successful? I, I haven't seen it so much for, for um, these days for nature control, not so much. Um, it's, it's more trolley sprays I see. Um, I think people have been relying on the systemic um, chemicals up until very up until this year, yeah. um, and yeah. that, that's really where we got to. We really haven't explored contacts enough. Um, I think flippers new on the market. Um, SB has been used, but more of an insurance policy by people whenever they're spraying fungicides. It's an extra thing in case they've got some aphids in the crop. So really, this is all new territory as well. We haven't really been forced to to find out how to get the best out of the contact. Yep. Products. And I think the next couple of years, we're all going to have to have a serious look at how we can best use these products. Um, how do you use a radical? How do you use Flipper? Um, how do you use all these products that are commonly available? And Majestic is there as well, Majestic, and that's you know yeah. we you know yeah. from our discussion earlier, it's they're definitely not products that we see very widely used. Um, yeah. So, but um, we, they, they, there are products we all have, we have to understand how they work, and how to get the best of them. Some of the products, as you probably know, require warm temperatures. Some don't, some need to dry fast, some don't. So it's understanding all of these things. And also some of the products uh, we know will affect young aphids, but not the adults and vice versa. So which products do you use for the, for the first instar stage, second instar stage, or third or fourth instar stage? And again, we need to look into the product labels and understand how to use these things much more than we ever did before mm -hmm. to get the best use of these products. Um, yeah. So yeah, we're all guilty of this. And I think we're gonna be forced to spend more time thinking about these products to try and make them work yeah but I, I guess at least if they we are being forced into using them they are a little bit softer and gentler and safer to use um and good for the operator as well as the environment exactly yeah yeah, yeah. handling okay. intervals and things like that are quite quite positive for the the grower mm -hmm. yeah david i'm going to say thank you very much again um, I really appreciate your time. I know you put in a lot of effort preparing for to this evening's presentation. So it's been really great, very interesting. Um, I'm very positive, you know, to see all the, the options that are out there. So um, I'm going to say thank you. I wish you well for the rest of the season. And hopefully we'll actually, all of us as a group, will get to meet um, maybe before the end of the year. You never know. Thank you. Yeah. So, thank you, everybody. And, uh, um, a good few uh, nice messages coming in there thanking you as well. So that's brilliant. It's very appreciative. Thanks for listening. <laughs> so very good. We'll talk to you again, David. And mind yourself. And thanks to everybody for uh, joining us this evening. All the so, best. Take care. Thanks. Take care. See you, David. Bye bye.